Uh, why care about Sudan? Now, I have to say, and I, I've said this, it upsets my friends in the NGO community and the church community, that the, the Sudan issue has been an issue for the church and the synagogue and religious groups in the United States and the NGO community and human rights groups because of the atrocities committed over a 50, 60 year period. Since independence, four million people, most of them southerners and civilians have died, uh, some of them uh, in atrocities that are unimaginable. The first cable I read when I joined AID in the uh, administration of George H.W. Bush 25 years ago was a cable saying that the, not the current government, but the previous government, which had been democratically elected when they caught Dinka soldiers, were crucifying them as their means of execution. Because under Sharia law, one of the means of acceptable execution, I don't know if you know this, is, is crucifixion. I, I thought this was a joke. I said, this, is, this, is, <laughs> this can't be. No, no one does this anymore. And they said, oh, my, my, my. And they definitely do it. Uh, and so that was my introduction in, in May of 1989 to Sudan. Uh, and I don't mean it critically that the NGOs and human rights groups and, and church has, has dominated this, but we should look at this also as a strategic issue. The second largest producer of oil in Africa after Nigeria is Sudan. 75% of the oil reserves of Sudan are in South Sudan, which is now an independent country under a peace agreement, which we helped negotiate. In fact, President Bush called President Bashir 12 times <clears throat> to get him to sign the agreement. Bashir told me that one of the reasons he agreed to it is because he, he actually believed George Bush wanted peace in the country. Now, President Bashir's worldview and my worldview are very different. The second reason we should care about Sudan is something that's not well known, and I have to be a little critical of the conservatives in the United States, particularly in Washington, who have not recognized that Sudan is a much larger threat in terms of the Muslim Brotherhood than any other country in the Middle East, and I say that carefully. We, because people haven't focused on it, don't seem to understand the Muslim Brotherhood has been governing Sudan since Omar al-Bashir took power in a coup in June of 1989. The parties called the, it was called then the, uh, N the NCP, the, uh, it's called now the NCP, the National Congress Party. It is the Muslim Brotherhood. It's not a secret. If you ask them, they'll tell you. If you read the secular newspapers that were hostile to the Muslim Brotherhood in Cairo, when the uprising took place against President Mubarak, they blamed Sudan for keeping the Brotherhood alive all these years. The greatest figure, the greatest living figure in the Muslim Brotherhood in the world is Hassan al-Tarabi, who I know very well. I've known him for 25 years. He's a brilliant intellectual. He went to the Sorbonne. He went to the uh, University of uh, London. And he... Uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, Bin Laden was not that smart. Uh, 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 um, in fact, He's obviously dead, and Tarabi is still alive. Tarabi is, is in my view, a, a very dangerous genius. He orchestrated the conversion of northern Sudanese society into an Islamist state and is the only figure who was able to unite Iran and Sudan. The base of operations for Iranian intelligence is Sudan. This is not a secret, by the way. There are several books written as by leading Sudan, scholars of Sudan. Robert Collins was the leading American historian in Sudan. This is not a, you know, a conspiracy theory. I'm just telling you what the, all of the uh, empirical and historical evidence shows. They, 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 this is well known. It's in the newspapers in Sudan. The, the president of Iran, Ahmadinejad, former president, visited regularly in Khartoum. And President Bashir regularly goes to Iran. The base of operations of the Iranian intelligence service for all of Africa is Sudan. And you know that there's a historic hatred between the Shia and the Sunni. We're seeing this played out in Syria. That is not the case because in, in Sudan because Tarabi is so revered as an Islamist, and he's a Sunni, that the, the leadership in, in after there was a breach between Bashir and Tarabi, uh, they sent delegations from the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and from the Ayatollahs in Iran to heal the breach. They were so upset that that Tarabi and, and uh, Bashir were fighting, and they hate each other now, and they do hate each other. Tarabi married, uh, his uh, uh, niece married bin Laden's daughter. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> That's a first, yes. Bin La bin, um, Hassan al-Tarabi's niece married Osama bin Laden. Okay, if you look at the newspapers. 
not the son. He married Bin Laden. You'll notice in the papers it says that Bin Laden had a Sudanese wife. That's Tarabi's niece. Again, well known. Tarabi brought Bin Laden to Sudan. He ran all of his operations before he was expelled because of pressure from the Clinton administration. He was expelled to Sudan. The plan of the Muslim Brotherhood, of the National Congress Party, the radical Islamists, was to use um, Sudan as a base of operations for the radical Islamization of Africa. And again, I use these, these terms from a scholarly standpoint. I'm not making, you can, this is objective research. It's in all of the literature. Uh, Rob, uh, uh, Millard Burr and Robert Collins wrote a very famous book about Tarabi Sudan in the 1990s, a very controversial book, but these were leading historians of Sudan. Why this has been missed in the West, I don't know. It's very dangerous. It is very dangerous. Now, Tara uh, Bashir is trying to survive. He's just purged the rest of his cabinet of all of the uh, civilian Islamists. It's all, now the Sudan in the north is all run now by the military and the secret police, and they're quite brutal because he is trying to survive. The, the purpose of the, the first priority right now, Bashir, not the Muslim Brotherhood, is survival. He wants to stay in power because he's afraid if he, gets, if he leaves power, he's under indictment for war crimes by the ICC for the atrocities in Darfur. He's afraid he'll go on trial. So he doesn't want to leave office. And many of the generals who committed the atrocities are worried as well. Now, what does this have to do with what happened in southern Sudan? December 15th, there was a blow-up, and um, there's various, various uh, stories as to what happened. I've been able to piece it together, and I think this is a fairly accurate description of what happened. It's been, I've been very careful trying to, because different people have different points of view. There has been a breach for six months a year in the leadership of the southern movement. Now, the north is Muslim, Arab, and is 45% uh, African in the north, but Muslim African, and 55% Arabized Africans. They're not really not Arabs genetically. They are Arabized um, Africans, uh, but they speak um, Arabic, and they are Muslim. The south is 70% Christian, 30% uh, the traditional religions, and it is but it's dominated by the church. And it's the fastest conversion to Christianity, I think, that's ever taken place in modern history. And they did it, they, the leadership explained to me, I've been going there for 25 years, we did this as a protection against the Islamization of the South, because that was the plan. Tarabi's plan all along was to Islamize the South. The countries in the area, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda, are using the South as a buffer zone from this, this Islamist, uh, uh, um, uh, movement that they are worried will destabilize their side because all three countries have large Muslim populations. They are Sufist Muslims and so far they're hostile to the Muslim Brotherhood but there's missionaries in there trying to convert them to a more radical form of Islam which is of course what's happened in Nigeria and you see what the results are in Nigeria. So what happened is there's a breach in the leadership. Salva Kiir, the president, who took over after Dr. John Garang died in a helicopter crash six weeks after the North-South Peace Agreement was implemented. Uh, I had a hand with Senator Danforth, and I, I was a peripheral person. He negotiated, not me. But President Bush, as I said, played a major role in that. But uh, Dr. Garang, who led the, the rebellion in the South for 22 years, died in a crash. Salva Kiir took over. He was the deputy commander of the military. Salva is, is not a... He does not want to overthrow the northern government. His view is we should consolidate the south. He used to tell me that when I was the envoy. And his view is that we cannot be at war with the north. And there's one simple reason why. It's an economic reason. The oil pipeline that carries the oil from the southern oil fields, which is 75% of the oil reserves of all of Sudan, goes through the north to Port Sudan. If Bashir closes that down, which, which is what happened uh, for a year and a half, almost two years, uh, there was no revenue to the southern treasury. 92% of the revenue that goes into the south is from that, those oil revenues. They're seven billion dollars a year, huge amount of money for a very poor country. It's in, in one of the most least developed areas in the world. That shut down and it caused uh, almost a depression. It was 60, 70 percent reduction in the GDP in one year. The northern government lost all that revenue too when the south became independent in January of 2011. So there's been a 15% uh, reduction in GDP, and then the second year a 10%, and then the third year a 5%, I believe. 
huge economic convulsions in the North as well because they lost the oil, oil wealth. But they made a deal, finally, after a year and a half of fighting, uh, 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 to, to share the oil wealth. Uh, the majority would go to the South, but there'd be several billion dollars that would still go to the North in, in transit fees. Salvaquir believes if that's disruptive, the South is going to be collapse. And in fact, it will. Over time, it will collapse because there's, there's no other revenue. So one of the issues, a larger issue, which has been lost in the news media, is this division. The old leadership that John Garang put together that ran the war in the South to victory, negotiated the peace settlement, and were cabinet ministers, want to take down the Bashir government. They despise the Islamists. They despise the Arabs. I've said that in my book. Some people said you, you use such, such extreme language. I'm quoting what the Southerners say. The Southerners, by the way, voted 98.5% in a free and fair election for independence. That should give you some indication of their view of the North. The one thing they despise more than each other <laughs> is the Arabs in the North, particularly the Muslim Brotherhood. They want a secular democratic state. They do not want a religious state. So there is rivalry between Salva Kiir, who is a Dinka, the largest tribe, and Riyak Machar, the second largest tribe. He's a new heir. And they, don't, they really dislike each other very intensely. And they have for some time. That's not a new thing. I have argued with both of them that unless they stay united, the North will take advantage because they manipulate the tribes against each other. That's how they kept the war going since 1956 off and on. Why four million people died. They manipulated one tribe against another, and they armed one tribe against another, and the Southerners went along with it. President Bush put heavy pressure on the Southerners to reunite, because the two tribes, the biggest tribes, were on both different sides of the war. And they did. I was shocked when uh, Riyak Machar and John Garang walked into my office, and they hate each other, or they used to hate each other. And they walked in together, and I said, I just can't believe this is happening. And they said, well, we, for the larger good, we are going to unite. Machar was until... Um, uh, this past summer, the vice president, from the time the peace settlement was, uh, he was the vice president and the head of the leader, the erstwhile leader of the largest tribe, the second largest tribe, the New Air. What's happened now is Salva Kiir believed uh, that the more militant leaders who want to take down Bashir believed he was compromising too much on the uh, north-south issues. And they also believed that there was too much corruption in the government and they believe that the pace of reconstruction has been too slow uh, and the government's too weak, and they blame Salva Kiir for that. And they wanted to remove him, and there was an open effort. There were meetings, and it was in the news media. You can see it online, where all the old leaders of the movement had a press conference, said Salva Kiir needs to go. They were going to go through a democratic process to do it. So part of this fight is a breach within the ruling party, the SPLM, the Sudanese People's Liberation Movement. There's also this tribal element. Now, what happened is, once Salva Kiir tried to disarm all the Nuer in the presidential guard, it blew up. They massacred the Dinka soldiers from his province, massacred the Duer, and we believe thousands of them were massacred, most of them civilians, most of them civilians. It was horrendous what happened. This was in the 15th, 16th, and 17th of December. They were dumping the bodies in the Nile River, and they were floating down while the croc crocodiles ate them all. So this is now uh, a, a perfect, because Bashir is under severe stress in the North. He loves this. I told them the, the great beneficiary of this breach is the Arabs in Khartoum and the National Congress Party in Omar al-Bashir. But because so much blood has been shed that it's going to be hard to put it back together again. Now what happened then is Riyak Mashar escaped because while this um, bloodbath was going on, uh, Bashir, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Salva Kiir, uh, arrested the 11 cabinet ministers who he had fired in July, said there was a coup d'etat attempt, which there's no evidence there was a coup d'etat attempt, and they tried to arrest Riyak Machar. He escaped, mobilized the Nuer, went into the bush in the Nuer homeland, and raised an army of 20 or 30,000 troops. 40% of the troops of the uh, SPLA are, were, were, have defected to him. But 60% of the Nuer have stayed in the army, and the chief of staff of the Southern Army is a Nuer, from his tribe. So the notion that this is, at the elite level, a tribal thing is complete nonsense. But what, in order to get troops, uh, Riyak Machar and Salva Kiir mobilized their respective tribes so they could survive. And now it becomes a tribal war. 
Uh, that's the way it's done. It's, it's done in the North for years. It's done in the South. It's done in other countries as well, unfortunately. We have a big mess in our hands. This was a huge, could potentially have been a huge success story. It's still possible to put this back together. They, they signed on the 22nd of uh, January a peace agreement, a, a uh, ceasefire agreement. They open uh, corridors up because there's 700,000 displaced people are not eating, many of them. They have no food, and they're in hiding in the UN compounds around the south. The peacekeepers uh, let them in to, so they wouldn't get massacred. And so uh, they're not being fed because no one's allowing food, so the, the agreement says they'll do that. The next step in the process, now that, there's that, that was signed, is uh, a political settlement. That is going to be the very difficult, most difficult part of this, is getting a political settlement to reintegrate the old leadership of the SPLM with Salva Kiir and his new leadership. His new leadership were Southerners who were with Bashir during the Civil War. So what the Southerners say now on the streets is the, the Garang boys have been replaced by Bashir boys in the cabinet. I mean, it's, it's almost, for the Southerners, it's unimaginable that people who were sympathetic to Bashir are now running the government. Now, Salva Kiir was not one of them. But he, in order to make peace with Khartoum, he had to put people in his cabinet who Bashir is not going to try, you know, is, is happy with. Because he has to keep that pipeline open. So that's the situation now. Uh, we, the, the, you know, the United Nations, the Europeans, uh, the neighboring powers, and the United States have all been on the same page, thank heaven for once, trying to get a settlement so we can put this thing back together again. Are there any questions? Well, let me just say, first of all, thank you for <clears throat> a very comprehensive uh, rendering of this. I, I forgot to mention, though it may have come to your attention, that um, uh, Andrew is currently a professor at uh, the uh, uh, Bush School of Government at Texas A&M. And if that uh, sounded like a rather professorial <laughs> treatment of this subject uh, in its comprehensiveness, it, it, it's uh, for good reason. Uh, Ariel has reminded me that uh, the government in Khartoum, excuse me, the government uh, in South Sudan is not the only government that has Muslim Brotherhood sympathizers uh, in it. Uh, to what extent does the uh, Obama administration uh, bear some responsibility for how this has played out? I, um, I know that they helped broker this agreement, but do you feel that their sympathies have lied too much with the North in all of well, this? Well, some of the people on the NSC, like Susan Rice, and Gail Smith are militant anti-Bashir activists. And they would attack me when I was saying I wasn't hardline. I was pretty hardline. They would not let me into Khartoum when President Bush, for two weeks, they would not give me a visa because they said we're not taking our enemy and bringing him into Khartoum. And, and Bashir used to say to me, are you representing yourself or the U.S. government when you speak? And uh, he would try to imply that I was more militant than anyone else in the United States. But, but the president himself is in a different position, in my view, than his own staff is. He has a very acrimonious relationship with Salva Kiir. President Bush invited Salva Kiir repeatedly to the Oval Office. When things were deteriorating, when I was envoy in October and November of 2007, the North-South almost went back to war. I think there would have been a massacre of the uh, same scale as Rwanda if they had. President Bush called Salva Kiir in with his cabinet and said, no military solution to this. You're going to negotiate this. That ended just because he said so. It ended the possibility of war between the North and the South that would have collapsed the peace agreement. Thank heaven. President Obama has never invited Salva Kiir, and he doesn't like him. They don't like each other personally, frankly. And um, so, uh, Pre President Obama said that Salva Kiir lied to him about some issues. He said this publicly. Salva Kiir has said the president, the, the, the president uh, is not where George Bush was, and we don't know where he is. We think the Southern, some Southerners think the president is sympathetic to the Muslim Brotherhood. The administration policy, and, and this is not a secret, the administration policy before El Sisi had the coup uh, last summer in July was to try to work with them. Now, I'm not saying that's sympathetic to them, but I mean, there were people arguing we can move them to a more constructive position. I never thought we could. I never thought we could. As I dealt with Tarabi, they're very good at manipulating language. They say the right thing, but the reality is <laughs> they're very fanatical, and they have a plan. They have a plan which we refuse to recognize. Amen. 
Questions? Fred? I have two quick questions. Uh, first of all, uh, what, what could you say about what the Sudanese government is doing to uh, maybe provide arms or encourage the insurgency in South Sudan? And, and, a, and a different question, could you talk about the relationship between Sudan and China? Uh, China is one of Sudan's uh, patrons. And they, they for example, the, uh, the, um, that pipeline that I mentioned, it's 60% funded by the Chinese oil and gas company, the national, national -like company. Um, they have a large presence in the south as well. They run the oil fields. They're the largest oil company. There are three big oil companies in the south. Petronas Oil from Malaysia, the Indian Oil and Gas Company, and the, Ch the Chinese Oil and Gas Company. But the biggest by far is the Chinese. The Chinese have only one interest, stability. They do not want any of this going on. Why? They want that oil. They also invested billions of dollars in building four huge dams north of Khartoum and the Nile River because the, the northern Sudanese have adopted the Chinese view of development, massive projects that are supposed to transform the landscape, which they did. The question is, the institutions are so screwed up in northern Sudan, it doesn't make any difference how many dams you build, it's not going to fix the country. And the Chinese now have invested that money in fixed assets. You can't move a dam once it's built, and they want to get their money back. So they, they have an interest, it's very clear, it's, and it's an economic interest. They, in fact, have been very helpful to the South since it was clear the South was becoming independent. They said, all right, you're going to become an independent, we'll work with you too. And there are Chinese merchants and construction companies all over southern Sudan right now. What was the first question? Uh, to, to what extent is the Sudanese government backing? Uh, yes. Uh, they were backing after independence, was in July of 2011. Um, I went to the celebration. Salvakir himself invited me to come as his guest when I came, even though I was no longer in office anymore. And... Um, uh, since then, uh, uh, there was a, a uh, tribe, the Morley tribe, about 300,000 people, who are very warlike, very isolated. They kidnap children, they kidnap cows. It's a cattle culture, so if you kidnap cows, you're, you, know, you're, you disrupt a lot of things. There are about 10 million head of cattle in southern Sudan. It's the largest ratio in Africa. Wow. It's, it's, a, it's a remarkable culture, actually. When I would visit a village, they would always slit the throat of a cow in front of me, and I had to jump over the car carcass as it was kicking, uh. as his head was rolling off, uh, because when senior officials and the aristocracy from the old uh, chieftains would visit, they'd often have, have to sacrifice a bull in order for you to be there. So, um, so, so the Morley was a big problem. The Morley were funded by and armed by Bashir after independence. Bashir said he wouldn't do that. It's nonsense. It's now there's a Swiss think tank. A small Arms Institute, and they've now proven, I think, without any question, that the government has been arming the Murale, 10,000 troops under David Yaya, to cause chaos in the South. And it has caused chaos in the South. They've gone and they murdered people, and then there was reciprocal murders that went on. By the way, there have been atrocities by Riyak Machar's people. He raised that army. He's taken the Nuer homeland. I didn't say this. And he massacred Dinka just as the Dinka massacred the Nuer. So both sides have blood on their hands. Don't let anybody tell you that mm. one side is to blame and the other side has nothing on their, you know, on their conscience. They do. So the North was clearly doing this. Now what's happened since this took place December 15th, David Yahya has signed an amnesty agreement with the government and joined the government. Now I said, doesn't that tell you something? I mean, how? After two and a half years of war, all of a sudden, David Yahya joins the government, accepts an amnesty offer. Why is that? It was the day after Omar al-Bashir visited Khartoum that David Yahya said, I'll, assume, I'll agree to the amnesty. Why is that? Because I'm sure Salva Kiir said, please, can you end this insurgency? This is an additional problem we have. And Bashir, I'm sure, gave the order, and that's exactly what happened. So it's pretty clear now that they were arming, and they're causing chaos. They caused chaos in the South. There were 70 armed militias paid for by and armed by Khartoum during the 50 years of the Civil War, and Salva Kiir had to absorb all those into the Southern Army. You know the largest land army in Africa? It's not in Nigeria, South Africa. It's in Southern Sudan. They have 300,000 troops in their army. Wow. 125,000 125, regulars and 125,000 militias that they have absorbed and pay on, they have on, on the payroll. It's very expensive. So yes, they were um, arming them before. I think Salva Kiir and Bashir need each other to survive. 
Both of them need each other. Because if that oil field shuts down one more time, both of them are toast. And they know it. And they know it. Their economies will collapse. Any other questions? Andrew? Uh, Ariel? Yes. Um, what kind of sanctions? Huh? What kind of sanctions uh, Northern Sudan is under right now? Uh, are they general sanctions or only personal sanctions against? Every conceivable sanction known to mankind is on this northern Sudanese government. More sanctions are in northern Sudan than in Iran, and I mean that seriously. Um, all of the sanctions on the oil in Iran are also, were also on the oil in, uh, in, uh, that w before independence. Now they removed them because that <laughs> would have meant that southern, the southerners couldn't sell their oil. But uh, it almost collapsed the northern economy when George Bush imposed um, uh, sanctions on the oil uh, shipments out of Khartoum. So there, everything you can conceive of. Now what the administration has said is they will begin to put personal sanctions on leaders on both sides if it appears that they are not complying with what they sign. So the enforcement mechanism for this uh, ceasefire agreement is the U.S. government. I, People aren't saying it that way, but that's in fact what's going on. But the sanctions on the oil sector in the north still still apply. I believe they have they are no longer uh, applying because uh, if they were, then the southerners couldn't sell the oil from the southern oil fields. It's one of the first things that I think President Bush had to try to rescind because if he hadn't done that, it would have collapsed the southern economy.